greetings to uh, everybody in the audience uh, and as well as Zoom audience. Uh, as a grand rounds feature, um, we will adopt our typical format. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker. I'll also do a quick introduction of our three panelists. They'll come after Dr. Roar's talk uh, and sit at the front. Each will be um, asked to give a, a short response uh, to the presentation that's given by Dr. Roar. And they'll also have the opportunity uh, to ask a question. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to the audience uh, for questions. And I'll try to monitor what shows up in the chat uh, on my iPad so we can have a good give and take. So first, let me tell you about a very special guest, Dr. Monica Aurora. Uh, Dr. Aurora has a unique position in India. She's the Vice President of the Public Health Foundation of India. This is an institution that you're going to hear a lot more about, uh, created some years ago uh, as a means of addressing a national need for public health education and training and research. Uh, she's also the president of the NCD Alliance. This is a key non-governmental organization that's been so much at the forefront of advancing uh, the sustainable development goals as they relate to non-communicable disease. She has a whole number of other leadership positions, both national and international, uh, but she's going to tell you a little bit about that uh, as part of her talk. Uh, and in terms of her training, she has her Master's in Science and Child Development from Delhi University, a Master's of Science in Public Health and Health Promotion from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a PhD in Preventive Cardiology from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So first, let's give a hand and welcome Dr. Murga. And let me tell you now a little bit about our three panelists who uh, will be coming up after the uh, talk is over. Uh, the first is uh, Ronnie Kofa, who's a physician, I'm sorry, a, a lawyer, MPH, uh, an academic, who's the senior strategist uh, at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics right here at the Price School of Public Policy at USC. And part of her role here is actually to serve as a bridge between the Price School and our Department of Population and Public Health Sciences to build collaborations between our two units. And recently she's been building uh, a collaborative research and training hub um, in India and has been, it's gonna be one of the principal leaders uh, with the new initiative that's been funded by the provost on our collaboration with the state of Magalia. She spent 30 years uh, building collaborations between academic institutions in North America and uh, a number of low and middle income countries in Middle East and Asia and Africa. Uh, and she was involved in the initial visioning of the Public Health Foundation of India when she was at Harvard. Uh, Michael Goran, um, who is joining us from the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, is also a member of our faculty. Uh, Dr. Goran is the Robert C. Atkins Chair in Childhood Obesity and Diabetes at the Keck School of Medicine. He's also the uh, NPI, the new P50 NIH Center uh, that is uh, dedicated to investigating uh, the obesity epidemic, particularly in our uh, Hispanic Latino communities here in Los Angeles. Uh, and that's going to be uh, a really interesting counterpoint to some of the research that uh, Dr. Rory will be describing because of the obesity epidemic happening right here in the U.S. as well as in India. And our third panelist is Heather Whipley, of course, our own professor here uh, in our department. Uh, professor of Clinical and Population Public Health Sciences, who also happens to be leading our undergraduate initiative. Uh, Heather is a global tobacco scholar. In fact, I read her book on global tobacco before I even took this job. Uh, and uh, she's been uh, a leader in understanding uh, tobacco control all over the world. 
Uh, so that's uh, that's it for introductions, and let, let me now turn to Dr. Thank you, Professor Wu, for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining today. And um, I'll be talking briefly about uh, two uh, dominant issues, obesity and tobacco use among adolescents. This is the work primarily of the Health Promotion Division at the Public Health Foundation of India. But just to provide a quick uh, understanding of what Public Health Foundation of India is. So we are a public-private partnership, and which was um, envisioned and set up when there was no public health training institutes in India. So we were set up in 2006, and um, this was a partnership where we had private sector as well as the government coming together to put funds along with foundations and uh, US, UK universities wanting to build capacities in India to set up the schools of public health. So uh, we have a governing board uh, with the president um, uh, reporting to the governing board. Under the president, we have the research advisory council and very, we are very fortunate to have uh, Professor Howard Hu, be the co-chair of the research advisory council. We have research um, management committee uh, as well as uh, research uh, ad academic advisory council and uh, academic management committees, which look at our operations, both academic and research internally, but getting guidance from external experts to be able to design our programs and research. Um, the senior management includes vice president research, operations, finance, the three um, uh, people uh, looking at various divisions, and directors of our Indian Institutes of Public Health, which are actually our uh, academic institutes that offer MPH and PhD trainings. Indian Institutes of Public Health uh, are in five locations. Delhi, Gandhinagar, Bhubaneswar, Hyderabad, Shillong, and Bangalore is our uh, satellite campus, which is now becoming an independent RIPH. So the geographies of it is that we are covering north, south, east, west, and northeast. So to be able to have this commitment, which was given to us that we have these schools set up. After PHFI was uh, set up in 2006, we now have a lot of medical schools who have come up with MPH training programs, but PHFI remains to be the unique school of public health from the point of view that it is multidisciplinary. We don't have that kind of disciplines yet come up in any other institute having economists, lawyers, physicians, clinicians, behavioral scientists, epidemiologists sitting under one roof and doing multidisciplinary research. We also have our independent centers of excellence, which are in different uh, IIPHs. So we have Center for Digital Health, which does a lot of um, uh, AI-related work, as well as creating health apps, uh, creating um, diagnostic and screening tools, which are then given to the government, since we are a public-private partnership, so we work very closely with the government. Uh, Center for Con uh, Control of Chronic Diseases and Injuries. There is a South Asia Center for Disability and Development. Uh, our Social Determinants Health Center looks at women and equity issues in research and uh, programming, uh, health programming. And Center for uh, Digital Health uh, separately, which uh, looks at particularly diagnostics. So that is a bit of background, and I can uh, talk more about PHFI uh, during the interactive session. So I will quickly move on to um, the next slides. And this is not moving. Oh, just click the laptop mouse. Okay. Click the, uh, there. All right. So I will skip these slides, and I come straight to the topic that I am going to talk about. So under adolescent health, we have uh, various issues which are um, hitting India currently. We have both burden of undernutrition and overnutrition. So while we are rapidly seeing a decline in undernutrition, wasting, and uh, thinness, 
we are seeing a rapid increase in overweight obesity as well among adolescents. So when it comes to interventions and programming becomes a bit of a challenge where we have to do messaging which addresses both ends of the spectrum. Physical activity, a very large number of adolescents in the age group of 11 to 17 are insufficiently physically active. Tobacco use is declining among adolescents. However, smokeless tobacco is unique to our region. The Southeast Asia region does not have so much of a burden of smoking cigarettes, but we have uh, local uh, cigarette beeries, which is smoking beeries, and smokeless tobacco is very, very prominent. So while with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, India has a tobacco control law, we have been able to bring down smoking of cigarettes, but we are still having to grapple with the issue of smokeless tobacco and beery smoking. On the sexual health, um, uh, interventions have surely uh, brought down the rates of childbearing, uh, underage childbearing, but um, there is also that people are getting married still very young as the cutoffs are 18 and 21 to be the legal age. And exactly at that age, we are seeing about 25% of young women and um, uh, similarly about 15% of men getting married by that age. Mental health issues are now being re reported very prominently because of the academic pressure that uh, adolescents go through. And they have reported uh, mood swings, uh, anxiousness, anxiety about studies, examination, which is a huge issue to be um, controlled and addressed. So uh, the government is definitely plan has planned uh, adolescent health programs and also realizing that about 378 million adolescents and uh, youth call India their home. So this is a population we just cannot ignore. Uh, and Hitherto, they were uh, a group which was always thought to be very healthy and not a lot of uh, importance was given to their uh, health issues. It was only in uh, 2014 uh, that the government launched a National Comprehensive Adolescent Health Program. The uh, literature uh, internationally, the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and uh, many other uh, literature from India pointed very clearly that uh, if we wanted to reap the benefits of this demographic dividend, we had to invest in adolescents and ensure they are healthy to be able to contribute to the economic productivity. Looking at um, the obesity trends, um, which I just talked about, so very clearly we can see that uh, the percentage of um, overweight among both men and women is going up from 2015 to 2019. This is our National Family Health Survey. Also, uh, if we look at adults aged 20 years uh, and over and children and adolescents 5 to 19, these are the projected trends, um, very clearly showing all age groups and all gender are seeing an upward swing. NCD risk factors in rural, urban, uh, if again we compare, um, overweight, including obesity. Um, it is urban, rural boys, girls. Overall, uh, we are seeing that there is um, an increase and comparing um, overweight, obesity and obesity, these numbers were not seen till the last, if we did these surveys about 10 years back, um, we would not see in 15 to 17 these kind of prevalence but now we are seeing and reported cases even of type 2 diabetes in the school setting and hypertension in school setting, as well as uh, heart attacks, MIs at a young age of 21, 25 were unheard 10 years back. But these are realities. Um, again, some figures on how the stunting has gone down, 12.5%, wasting has gone down, but Overweight uh, obesity is um, increasing both among men, women, children, uh, all around. This is a state analysis. Uh, if we look at uh, overweight obesity among children by states, uh, we do see uh, in all the states, we have seen that obesity has increased. It has worsened 
it's only in Goa and in Tamil Nadu that we see a um, trend where it is not um, a significant increase, but otherwise all the states have that increase. And childhood obesity particularly is worrying because the projections from the World Obesity Federation from their atlas is actually projecting that we have a very high annual increase in adult obesity, which is projected of about 4% and in childhood obesity about 11% that is projected. So the burden is huge and uh, the environment is not conducive. We don't have enabling environment that would allow children to be physically active due to the school schedules and the extra classes they have after school. Even for um, rural, we do see that the burden has not yet reached the rural, but the worst hit are the urban poor, who are not able to access healthy food or healthy spaces to be physically active. So what has PHFI done in this regard? Um, apart from our clinical research and uh, the epidemiological work that is ongoing on etiology of overweight obesity among adolescents. Some things we have recently done for our planning commission, uh, Niti Ayo, wherein we were brought in to look at the food environment of uh, school students. And um, this is an initiative which is a consortium with UNICEF, National Institute of Nutrition, PHFI, doing it for our planning commission. Uh, we undertook a study to see what's happening in and around schools. There is a policy that there can be no sale of unhealthy food products, junk food inside school or uh, around 50 meters of school. However, when we undertook this study uh, as a cross-sectional study in nine schools and four colleges in uh, Delhi, uh, it was very evident that despite this law, 92.6% of parents have reported availability of food which is high in fat, salt and sugar, as well as beverages in and around the educational institutes. Also, um, uh, observations very clearly uh, was seen that the food available immediately when the school gets over, even in government school setting, uh, it was unhealthy food being served outside in school canteens, uh, unhealthy food options uh, were being uh, dispensed. And uh, students from these uh, private schools, which are uh, the non-government and colleges, were exposed to food advertisements in the school environment, which was again of foods which are high in fat, salt, and sugar. Another study we did was of content analysis, looking at the TV advertisements which children were watching. And we looked at um, channels which were washed by children versus channels which were washed by young adults. And the hours when children watched the television, the frequency of advertisement was the highest during that time. And these were all food items which are high in fat, salt, and sugars. So obviously, there is very clear targeting. They want them young and get addicted to these food items. So these results were given to um, uh, Niti Aayog, and currently um, uh, we are writing a nutrition strategy, a national nutrition strategy, not only for adolescents, but also what should be done overall. Since we have very heavy focus on uh, anemia, we have very heavy focus on Undernutrition, we get entire September month to be observed as portion month, which we call as nutrition month. But the messaging is all on undernutrition, and we need to now bring in the other aspect as well of overnutrition. But also, uh, while we were doing all this work, we realized who are missing from these conversations. It's the adolescents themselves. We are not engaging with them, um, not understanding why they are choosing the kind of food they do realize it is unhealthy food, yet they choose these food items. So we got them involved, uh, starting with doing a survey with them with about um, 150,000 uh, adolescents around the country. And um, also then engaging 50 of them were selected to become our initiative uh, health ambassadors. This was called Let's Fix Up Food. And these are our ambassadors who were trained um, in a way of meaningfully engaging them in uh, policy response, 
they were trained to be able to change their own canteen policies so that it is not seen as something which is imposed on them by the management, but they themselves creating those policies and then those messages trickle to the family as well so that the family eating is also influenced. These are the results of the survey, um, clearly highlighting consumption of unhealthy food items uh, was largely influenced by the food advertisements they were watching. Uh, to the extent they even reported that if we just search for a food item for the next one week, they are shown that food over and over again. So even if they don't want to eat that item, they are reminded. So there is this push um, advertising if they surf anything on the, their computers. Respondent views on uh, restrictions on eating healthy food. So they are expensive, they are uh, not tasty. So these are the various um, responses which we need to address when we are designing interventions. Uh, their source of nutrition information was largely schools. So a, a setting very clearly identified that if we have to do nutrition literacy and um, health promotion, it is the school environment we must target. Do you read nutrition labels? So uh, surprisingly, we uh, did get a very high that they do read uh, food labels, but they want these to be simplified. And currently, there's a lot of policy discussion going on in India as to which is the right kind of food labeling regime that uh, the population and the government should follow. So I talked about what the government is doing in this regard. Um, our government has launched uh, a comprehensive program which does focus on improving nutrition. It also focuses on sexual and reproductive health, mental health, preventing injuries, preventing substance misuse, and addressing non-communicable diseases. This was launched in uh, 2014 and uh, inter-ministerial coordination is a very important component because under this they have also launched a comprehensive school health program where teachers are the implementers and health department is the trainer. So this is an excellent example of how different departments have to come together and work and they have a very strong component of peer education program, which we have recently evaluated, and um, that is a talk for another time. Very interesting results as to how peer education approach is very successful in that context. Um, these are various national programs uh, which are addressing um, adolescents and uh, also ensuring they are protected through the policies by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India by giving guidelines that junk food should not be sold in the school environment. And these are the non-communicable disease targets uh, which the government has adopted to achieve by 2025, which is to reduce the um, burden of various risk factors like uh, overweight, obesity, alcohol use uh, reduction by 10%. So these are all relative reductions which are to be achieved by 2025. Coming to the second risk factor, tobacco. So as I said, for us, it is the myriad variety in which tobacco is available. So cigarette smoking is just a very small percentage of our problem. Um, when it comes to uh, local tobacco products, smokeless tobacco is in so many forms, which even we have not been able to document. It changes from state to state, region to region. There are so many variations and nobody knows the content in these and how much is the nicotine uh, or other um, toxic ingredients in it, we don't know. And um, our research in Delhi slums actually has shown that the age of initiation for smokeless tobacco is as young as six years because these products are available as mouth fresheners also with the same brand name and not only children, teachers, when we spoke to them, they also did not know. They said, oh, we did not know it's a tobacco product. So they start using it without even knowing. Tobacco burden, um, the prevalence is, as I said, uh, reducing over the years. We have the burden higher in rural areas versus uh, urban areas. But um, if we compare over the years, prevalence of tobacco use with the Global Youth Tobacco Survey, 
Um, we are seeing there are trends of showing reduction in current tobacco smokers, current um, cigarette smokers, beery smokers, but uh, smokeless tobacco is one area where there is reduction, but uh, still it is not same uh, to the level of what we see in cigarette smoking reduction. PHFI's uh, policy has been extensive uh, on uh, tobacco control research. We uh, have many experiments which have been adopted by the government, starting with our school initiative, which was an NIH-funded grant with um, University of Minnesota and University of Texas. Um, this was uh, an initiative, a randomized controlled trial with 14,000 students in uh, Delhi and Chennai. And um, we enrolled students, uh, gave intervention for two years, did our baseline and end line. So very significant results. We were able to show reduction in tobacco use by 17% in intervention group versus 68% increase in control group. So uh, this was a remarkable result um, because we were adapt uh, adopting and adapting a model from US of tobacco use prevention, which was the CATCH model. And uh, even the catch in US had not shown this kind of uh, crossover effect, which we were able to show in Indian context. Intentions to smoke reduce, intentions to chew uh, tobacco reduce. But here as well, our smokeless tobacco results were not to the same level as the reduction in uh, smoking prevention. This uh, program was um, given to the government of India when they were designing the national tobacco control program. And uh, with the state governments, we actually scaled up this model under uh, a grant by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the state of um, uh, Andhra Pradesh at that time and Gujarat. Uh, this was a STEPS project. It was a strengthening of tobacco control efforts through innovative um, partnerships and strategies. And at that time, the government of India had also launched the National Tobacco Control Program to have cessation component, to have uh, set up state tobacco control cells, but nothing was uh, operationalized. It was just be conceived. So we actually did uh, an, like an implementation research to give to the government what can work and what cannot work, and which is now our national program. So the school program is actually translated into guideline, the Tobacco Free Educational Institution guideline, and uh, from um, efficacy to effectiveness to scale up uh, stage reach. So um, very uh, rewarding to see that research programs being taken at the national level and adopted by the state government. Talking about some of our recent research, um, this is a, a study again, NIH funded with uh, Dartmouth School of Public Health. Uh, with Jim Sargent, we uh, were very easily able to show that tobacco use in Bollywood movies was actually um, associated with high tobacco use among adolescents. And um, very clearly uh, seeing that receptivity uh, to tobacco promotions also had a very important role. So uh, this is the first time we were able to show this association. We wanted to do a follow-up uh, longitudinal study, but uh, could not go through uh, to be able to follow up adolescents. But ever since that time, uh, since um, uh, 2006, we have been tracking movies and doing content analysis. So these were again uh, discussed with the government and under our uh, tobacco control law, uh, under advertising provisions, the government did manage to bring about this uh, guideline saying that if there is tobacco use exposure, they have to follow these guidelines. They have to get um, editorial justification. They have to put um, anti-tobacco health spots. There have to be static warnings and there has to be no display of brands, close-ups, and uh, glor glorification of tobacco use or glamorization, which actually became a bit of a challenge for producers and directors. They, did, they felt it was too tacky to have that warning. And gradually, uh, we started seeing a decline. So we did another study recently to see over the years from 2016 to th 2017, very clearly, the uh, tobacco use exposure incidents have reduced over the years. 
And um, also very clearly when this law came in 2012, there was a gradual increase that uh, we can see uh, before the law was in place. So there is an increase. And as soon as the law came in, there is this decline. So the power of having uh, the right policy um, is very evident from this research. Also, um, the annual change, uh, pre-policy and immediate change, uh, as well as post-policy, from 1.1 uh, tobacco incident per year, it came down to 0 0.7 uh, per year. So uh, this is one very um, exciting example that we feel is a policy win because of uh, evidence-based work uh, in the Indian context. However, what happened is with this decline came in the streaming platforms, the over the top. And they said, we don't have to comply with the law of the land. We are not from here. We are streaming from another country. So another study where we had to show how the exposure was high and it was as high as what we had not even seen in Bollywood films, the um, uh, tobacco, uh, total tobacco incidents for the series, if we see uh, this was the 10 series which were chosen by young people as most popular among them. So total tobacco incidents for the series of uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Mason was 1,652, which is very high. Um, we also did uh, that um, in terms of median number of tobacco incidents per episode for season is 102. So uh, this is like every hour they are being hit with a smoking message. Um, similarly, the ones which were coming from Hollywood uh, were high, whereas those from India were uh, a bit low on the exposure, but again, there were about 70% of the series had tobacco use exposure. The highest was The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, followed by um, uh, a few others, but Sacred Games was the Indian production, so 10.2 incidents per hour of the screen viewing. So again, um, we all got very worried that all that was brought in as a change with the Indian law is being undone with everything being glorified. And it was very prominent display of brands, uh, glamorization. So this uh, World No Tobacco Day, the government of India announced an amendment to their rule saying that streaming platforms also have to follow all the tobacco control advertising guidelines. So they will have to put health spots, they will have to put anti-tobacco health warnings, display of brands as banned, and failure to comply may result in action by an inter-ministerial committee because it is not just the health ministry, but information and broadcasting ministries domain as well. So they formed an inter-ministerial committee to act on this topic. On the uh, emerging novel tobacco products, so tobacco use is declining um, in terms of smoking, but then came in the e-cigarettes. Um, uh, we were seeing various generations being introduced in the market, but one good thing was as soon as we started getting online sales and stores set up, India was able to quickly bring in its evidence. It started with Ministry of Health organizing a round table in 2014 when the product had just started entering Indian market to discuss with this uh, expert group formed three subgroups on health, legal, advocacy, who produced their reports on what policy action should be taken. Uh, one important development was an advisory which the government issued in 2018 to the state governments very clearly highlighting that online sales should not be allowed, manufacture distribution and advertising of these can be uh, banned according to their jurisdiction because health is a state subject in India. In 2019, a white paper was issued by Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, PHFI, um, uh, Professor Srinath Reddy was an expert on this paper. This was a seminal paper which actually established and brought all the evidence which was available globally 
on uh, impact of e-cigarettes on adolescents. And um, this was instrumental in Ministry of Health planning an ordinance in 2019 that it, all kinds of electronic nicotine products would be completely banned. And um, after 2019, it became a bill passed by both houses of our parliament and got a presidential assent uh, in 2019 December and became a law. So it is an act now. Um, another very important policy win uh, based on evidence and expert opinion. However, um, 2020 COVID hit, government got busy with uh, COVID response and everything was available online. So e-cigarettes started coming online illegally and it could be ordered from anywhere. Um, all of us tried and all of us could get the delivery um, without age verifications and things like that. So um, we did a study uh, looking at why children were getting exposed, why they were using when it's an illicit product. We realized it was the influencers, if not the manufacturers who were advertising, influencers who the adolescents and youth follow. 189 influencers were identified who were promoting e-cigarettes as reported by adolescents in our study. And uh, we just looked at their Instagram accounts and 2.1% of the influencers had a verified account. Um, maximum influencers were from US that uh, adolescents in India were following, followed by Indonesia, Italy, and only 1% influencers belonged to India. These are our top influencers. E-stores were also looked at, which uh, again, we were pointed out by the adolescents themselves to look at these websites. 83 e-stores were identified who were delivering and 61.4% of e-cigarettes uh, stores were on Google, followed by Instagram, Facebook. So we are seeing a wide violation of a nationwide ban uh, through this sale. And again, results were used by the government and a portal has now been launched to report violation of ban on e-cigarettes. So anybody who uh, comes across a website can put up a complaint and it is uh, reaching the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So uh, just to give a glimpse of there is this growing burden, but uh, simultaneously policy responses are happening um, as these issues come up. It is very important for Public Health Foundation of India immediately to produce evidence because many a times this evidence is used in the court of law. Uh, industry takes the government to the court uh, as soon as a law is passed. And when they have this Indian evidence, they are able to produce because when they produce a US evidence or a global evidence, the industry says, this is not Indian evidence. This doesn't apply to our context. So it is very important for us to keep updating uh, this research evidence and be used in the courts. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're going to go into our panelist uh, portion of the program, uh, and we're going to ask each one of the panelists to uh, make a statement, and they're welcome to pose a question as well. We'll start off with Ryan Cohen. Can everybody hear me? Okay, yes. great. Okay. Um, I was reminiscing with Monica about the fact that even though the story is that the launch of PHFI happened in 2006, the genesis of that idea actually started back in 1999 to 2000 and began actually at the Harvard School of Public Health, where a then fairly new dean, uh, Dean Barry Bloom, who was, um, you know, interested in two different things. One was to make the Harvard School of Public Health under his tenure more international. And secondly, uh, to try to do something in India in particular, because he had had some, uh, like a seminal experience while at WHO, where he taught at All India Medical, um, All India Institute of Medicine, right, AIM and had a very soft corner for India. And the third was actually he wanted to leverage the alumni of, the, of Harvard, um, not necessarily the alumni at the School of Public Health, but other alumni 
to be able to take an interest in health in India. And there was a large cohort of non-resident Indians who had gone through Harvard Business School and who were quite interested in public health and were interested in having conversations about how Harvard could be involved in that. Um, and so we had a series of salons that brought together these kind of millionaire, billionaire types who were brought in to talk or think about what could public health look like in India uh, because they just, there wasn't the infrastructure there for research training, you know, um, much of anything really. And the original idea was to try to have an institute at Harvard that would be like on behalf of India or with India or for India. But that quickly got scrapped um, because these donors were quite interested in seeing something happen, not necessarily just at Harvard, but perhaps nationally. So other institutions like Hopkins, Berkeley, UNC, you know, all sorts of other institutions were brought on board. And then that idea got scrapped because there was a genuine interest in doing something in India itself. And so this became really kind of an interesting um, discussion about how were these kind of, you know, the diaspora of high level leadership donors going to be able to help feed something in India, um, working with the government uh, at some point. And Dr. Srinath Reddy, and in fact, Monica was involved, like I think both of us have been involved since 1999. Uh, but the idea was like, how was this even going to happen? How are we going to be able to see this? Um, so I share that because when I'm looking at some of your slides, I can't imagine. We had no idea that it was really going to turn out this way. Like the, that, the piece of that idea and seven years later, um, I would love for you to share because I thought that you had some slides that you kind of skipped over. Um, kind of the depth and breadth of PHFI, you know, the IIPH is there in six cities around the country, you know, the number of students you might have, the, the number of faculty, your research centers, if you could share some of that so people can kind of see that, that would be great. Okay, so um, these are our campuses, uh, just to show the geography. Uh, and the courses that we are offering. Uh, as I said, um, this is unique because it's very multidisciplinary and you can see we have integrated MSc and PhD in clinical research at IIPH Delhi, uh, apart from MPH and PG diploma in public health management. Uh, IIPH Shillong, um, IIPH Bhubaneswar, uh, Hyderabad, and uh, Hyderabad, again, is unique because it has a specialization in integrated MSc and PhD in health informatics. Um, again, MPH and PGD, uh, PHM remains. Our Gandhinagar campus is now an independent university under the government of Gujarat. So uh, many of these institutes started with support from PHFI as the central um, mothership and um, providing support in terms of faculty training because all of us who were uh, recruited at the time it was um, conceived and launched, uh, we didn't have uh, public health training. So we were sent to universities uh, in US, UK to be able to get trained, come back and write curriculum for India, which would be fit for our needs and to our context. So um, gradually these campuses were told to be independent. Now IIPH Gandhinagar is a deemed university. Um, IIPH Shillong uh, has become independent. IIPH Hyderabad has become independent. And so is the effort of Delhi, Bhubaneswar and Bangalore or along the same lines. So uh, this is just to give a, a breadth of our um, courses on campus programs being offered by all the um, IIPHs as well as PHFI Central offers some e-learning programs. These are distance learning programs which are both at PHFI as well as at IIPHs. We uh, have number of students who get enrolled, even the government um, uh, officials who are on the health programs, they are nominated by the government to come for both online as well as on-campus programs. 
So till date, we have about 4,100 um, students who have been trained. This is just our MPH uh, numbers, but uh, the number is much larger if we look at our PhDs and uh, other courses. And uh, having a faculty and staff of 400, uh, which are uh, spread over these uh, campuses, uh, researchers, academics, and other staff. So these are our employers. Uh, our students get employed at all these institutes, but also uh, many of them do take up research and academic positions within the institute and in other institutes which are now starting MPH programs. So it's like we can actually see how the bird has actually flowered and having its um, seeds spread all over. The fact that that's occurred in just a short period of time is just astounding. Yeah, I'm just going to pass it on to Michael, but I'll say one thing. So what did Harvard get out of this? Ultimately, Dean Barry Bloom ended up becoming the chair of research, right, for your International Advisory Council. And in fact, with the inauguration of PHFI, both Dean Barry Bloom and I think the president of Harvard was there, Larry Summers at the time. Yeah. So they've been able to say they were involved in seeding this in some way. So, okay. you know, it's a wonderful story. Michael. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Monica. It's so nice to meet you. Um, we wrote a grant together 13 years ago. Uh, it didn't get funded, but a lot has happened. Yeah. Even so. Um, and I think it is, uh, as Howard alluded to, this remarkable kind of similarity between what we're dealing with here. And that was the purpose of the grant back then was to do comparative epidemiology and comparative physiology. Too, which is something I did want to ask you about, because um, you covered some great ground in terms of describing the prevalence and the epidemiology and some of the successes you've had. Uh, but I was wondering, you know, globalization is here to stay. The, the, the U.S. diet is spreading, and that's not going to stop. People are still going to eat what they want to eat. So we're not saying that work is not necessary because it's very necessary. But I think also a big player in this is physiology and uh, differences between different segments of the population. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you what, what work is happening in that area. Like I was just actually, while you were talking, I dug up the grant from 13 years ago because I couldn't remember. And uh, Uman Alai is here. We, you were co-investigation. We were going to look at uh, gene diet interactions in India and in Latinos in Southern California, for example, which I think is still a necessary study. Um, and just a few words also about our new center that we that we got funded here. It's a regional center uh, that addresses disparities because the, the, the NIH and, and I think the Congress, this money was appropriated from Congress, recognizing disparities in the population. Um, our focus in Southern California is on Latinos, but there are other therapies too. But a major focus of those centers is in working with the community. So I wanted to ask you about that too, how much um, of the work that you do involves the community because we are, we are being, um, to our center, mandated to work in what they call bi-directional collaborations where the communities or members of the community are actually involved with the design of the research as well as the implementation uh, to help guarantee the success of the study. So uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing and I look forward to uh, more grants together and more collaborations because we're, um, the issues that we're faced here in Southern California among Latinos are also um, it's quite similar, probably 10, 20, 30 years ahead. Uh, so we can both learn from each other, I think. So, so yeah, wanted to ask you about the etiology, physiology, um, what's happening, um, and also the community interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Um, very important questions because it gives me a chance to talk about other work we are doing. So uh, with Emory School, um, we have uh, NIH grant and uh, in fact, uh, 43 grant for setting up a center and that's where we have the Center for Chronic Disease and Injuries. So they have set up a longitudinal cohort to look at cardiometabolic uh, risk factors. 
and um, we do blood work under that and uh, we have every uh, two years we uh, have surveillance uh, going on with them and their families so it is across age group we have a cohort where um, uh, physiology is being uh, uh, assessed their height weight anthropometry as well as uh, blood work is being done multiple papers uh, have been published from that work and in fact that gives us a ready cohort when COVID hit, um, we were able to use that cohort because we knew who were tobacco users from them. And we did a study with them to see how the COVID lockdowns was impacting tobacco use. And we realized that many people, uh, because of non-availability, actually had quit uh, tobacco because they could not step out. There were a uh, complete lockdown. And during the first wave, our government had completely uh, banned the sale of uh, tobacco because smokeless tobacco involved spitting. And that was one big uh, threat to uh, having the transmission of COVID by uh, COVID. So um, that cohort is very handy to do any kind of uh, supplementary research uh, we would want to do because it's a longitudinal cohort and continues. And how many subjects? Uh, this is about 5,000 and it's a um, uh, multi site. So we have it in uh, south, north. Uh, both the places. So that's a very good um, ongoing work. Uh, with regard to um, etiological, uh, we have done um, studies which are on behaviors uh, and we have identified some areas like um, regularity of breakfast um, was associated with low uh, prevalence of uh, obesity and um, other behaviors like family eating behaviors and uh, also the school um, having two breaks uh, to be able to have a fruit break and then have um, a longish break for uh, food. Uh, those kind of um, evidence has come from our, um, some of our ideological work, but also um, looking at um, the parenting and the parent cooking behaviors in the family, uh, those are some important research work which is ongoing. Uh, community component is very important and we have just been given an NIHR UK grant uh, with the University of Leicester and four other UK universities to study multimorbidity. And this is to be able to uh, work uh, not only with the health system, but community will uh, design the intervention. So it has an electronic decision support system, which we will be launching in a primary healthcare setting in um, Nepal and India. Uh, these are the two study sites. And uh, once we launch the electronic decision support systems, the health system is better equipped for doing diagnosis and for reference. But also uh, this is important because people with uh, living conditions they are being engaged in uh, designing this intervention and to become the community champions because they are the ones who have navigated the health system and uh, they become an expert in their own right. So uh, trying to work with them, if they can be trained to become a bridge between the health system and the community, so that will facilitate early diagnosis because they will be able to do uh, health promotion campaigns in the community and bring them to the health system, but also to overcome a lot of challenges like traditional healers at times who may not allow them to access the health system. How these community champions who are from the community would be able to address some of those barriers. So uh, this is a study which has just started. We are um, uh, doing our uh, situational analysis currently to identify who are the various stakeholders in the community who need to be engaged. But each of these community champions would have a patient network under them with whom they will be working and trying to support the health system and also inform our research. Thank you. Heather. Right, how are we on time? We're good. Okay. Um, so, so thank you so much for joining us, Monica. Um, Monica and I have known each other for, for decades. Um, we've been able to watch each other grow up into our careers, and it's just such a pleasure. And um, we're Facebook friends, of course. So when Sasha was coming to America, I had to say, wait, we have to fit in a, a UNC visit. So I'm so glad that you were able to do it. And we got her picture with Connie Trojan. So she's officially part of our family. Yeah. Um, 
So there's there's a few things I wanted to focus on from your talk. Um, the first was the role of adolescence, and both in terms of the important um, moment in time and life for intervention, um, but even more importantly, the role of adolescence in participation and having their voices be heard and being engaged in this work. And I know this is work that um, I've been engaging in, and I'm just so um, motivated by working with youth. And one of the things that I've really appreciated about um, the work that Monica does is she does her work um, within the context of, she has many jobs, right? So she's working at PHFI and, and directing research. She's also president of the NCD Alliance, which I wanna come back around to, but she also works um, with an adolescent um, nonprofit organization and has for as long as you've been involved. And, and so that's been a role model to me in, in kind of this idea of that we don't just do our academic day job, but that we're working directly with youth and engaging youth in, in real work. And so I wanted to highlight the importance of that work that you're doing and, and point out the, the role model that you've been to me as far as working with kids, getting in the schools, getting into their community groups and encouraging them to be leaders um, already. The, the second um, point I really wanted to focus on was, was the work that you were talking about with tobacco. And as you know, we have a TCOR, the Tobacco Regulatory Center here at USC, and we're doing much of the same research. But I think what's really interesting is that India is really ahead of us in many ways in terms of um, its experience with polyuse tobacco and the range of project products. And I remember 20 years ago talking about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and the host of interventions that we needed to um, employ and, and that being graphic health warnings and taxation and warning labels on packages and, and working with you and your team and saying, many of these interventions do not apply to the context of India where we're handling feedies or we have oral tobacco products. And, and so how do we adjust? And I think at the time we kind of pushed that aside in many cases and said, okay, well, India's gonna deal with that on its own. We're gonna move forward on the combustible cigarette challenge. And we find ourselves two decades later, um, all facing this challenge of poly tobacco abuse. There's a range of project product, products as well as um, the, the quickly changing environment. So you were saying that it's different in every place, and yet here it's different every place, and it's changing by the week of the products that are on the market. So I think that we can um, really learn a lot from our Indian colleagues about how to work in this type of environment, um, as well as um, just the incredible evidence that you pointed out. And I like to tell my students that you know my, my work is policy-relevant research. And so I'm not necessarily going for great discovery, but I'm going for great impact. And the work that you showed today is just a role model of how data can be gathered quickly and quite easily, but have a direct impact on policy outcomes very quickly. So that was really great. Your, your streaming example um, and really reminded me of the same challenges we were facing back in 2000 when we were negotiating the Framework Convention and thinking about satellite television and the inability of any one country to single-handedly address this challenge. Um, and it just made me feel like, wow, we're just still continuing playing a game of whack-a-mole. As soon as we do something, it pops up somewhere else and it just continues to change. And brought me back to thinking about, you know, we did the FCTC, we concluded that process, I think it had an impact, a really positive impact. We've seen combustible, combustible tobacco rates go down. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering what's now, what's next? What are we supposed to be doing? And if you kind of play a little bit on your role now as president of the NCD Alliance, what do you see as the global priority now for addressing tobacco and obesity at the international level? And like, what's the role of USC and other and PHFI and academic institutions in supporting and pushing that work forward? Thank you, Heather. So um, I would feel that uh, what is happening currently as NCT Alliance um, as well, um, there is a lot of focus from WHO and uh, governments on treatment of NCTs. Um, the prevention, preventive promotive aspect is even missing from their agenda. And that's where NCT Alliance is pushing for bringing in policies which are WHO best buys. Um, which focus on prevention and most of it is actually related to policies. 
because we have to reduce access of unhealthy food products if we have to address overweight obesity we have to address uh, at least protecting them in the school environment where uh, they do their maximum learning and they are even looking at nutrition information to come from schools but in indian setting there is uh, things like even uh, providing the skills to read the food labels uh, those interventions uh, and what is the right kind of messaging. So I think communication piece and that research, I would feel USC, PHFI um, must focus on uh, when we want people to be better informed. They would know that yes, high fat is unhealthy for them, but which food item is high fat, which is high salt, it's very difficult for them to apply that information practically into every day choosing food items. It is very well informed in uh, U.S. context. I do see um, it's very well labeled, but uh, in India, we would have a lot of misleading um, uh, advertisements where sugar would be written as 25 grams uh, of your daily recommended um, uh, values. So it is like nutrition is recommended for you. Um, which is again uh, these kind of challenges that uh, we even when we have to make the food selection uh, despite knowing uh, what the recommended levels are find it difficult so uh, communication is going to be a, a very big piece i think going forward not only with population level communication of preventing tobacco as well as uh, or preventing overweight obesity but also with the health system uh, when we are talking with the um, physicians, with uh, specialists, cardiologists, endocrinologists, and the patients who come to them, the amount of time they get with them is half a minute maximum when they are writing prescriptions for them. So there is no interaction or um, informing the patient that there are treatment pathways they can choose from. So there is no engagement of the community. Uh, whereas it is their right to know uh, what is the condition and um, what they would want to take forward. So much so to the extent because they have so uh, such a huge OPD pressure um, and even if somebody wants to talk, uh, the doctor feels that you would not even understand if I try to tell you what is your physiology. Uh, go and research what is vitamin D and what is, it is doing to your body. Those kind of derogatory remarks do come from them when they are under stress. So can we work uh, with the School of Communication here to come up with short packages, PSAs, which can run in the facility Rami and I were just discussing, can we do those kind of messaging and make short capsules for these physicians to talk to the patients, to have that skill to communicate quickly and important points so that it's not impinging on their time, but at the same time, a patient needs to hear from the doctor. Tobacco cessation uh, is, uh, doctors have a huge role if they just ask whether you are a tobacco user while taking history. So we all know the importance of engaging doctors. So I feel going forward, uh, these are some of the important research areas we would want to focus on. Thank you. That's great. Uh, just a question since I'm an amateur viewer of Bollywood. Um, could they get the uh, Charlotte Cones and the Ritik Roshans and the Ashwari Rise involved in public uh, public health campaigns? I mean, is that is there precedent for that in India? Well, right. Charlotte Cones. Some of those people are. Can you? Is this on? Yeah, some of those people are chain smokers. Howard. Howard. I don't know if that's possible, but Monica can speak to that. I would never go that far because they are endorsing smokeless tobacco. And they are being criticized widely for doing it because uh, all the top ones, Akshay Kumar, Shah Rukh Khan, they are all promoting smokeless tobacco product ads uh, because um, there is, again, the, the policy is being uh, circumvented because they have the same product as a pan masala, which is like a digestive or a mouth freshener, and the same brand is a smokeless tobacco. So they are promoting that in a big way. But yes, uh, an excellent example is we had Rahul Dravid, who is a uh, famous cricketer, uh, he endorsed uh, tobacco control campaigns, which were huge. Um, uh, it's, it was translated in all the Indian languages and play all over just before any movie shows tobacco use scene, those uh, ads are played. So those kind of celebrities who have ethical standards should surely be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great point. All right, let's uh, open this up for uh, general questions. We have a question here from Natalie Batiest. Um, how does PHFI adapted strategies and programs in response to changing public health trends or emerging health issues in India? So um, most of our research is uh, definitely investigator driven, but there's also a lot of research which is um, uh, worked out with the government of India. So responding to uh, various uh, research needs that they put want many a times we do get a request on this is an area, for example, e-cigarettes. Uh, that was something which came as a request that uh, e-cigarette research needs to be undertaken because evidence would be needed. Apart from that, yes, um, the public health challenges that we as a country face, uh, we quickly do respond to it by bringing together a group of experts who have interest in that area. Um, and we bring in the consortium partners, or it would be uh, we would get a funder who may want to bring a consortium together. So there are different uh, ways of going about it. But as of now, um, we uh, we have a uh, vision of the organization to be able to work on contemporary public health issues. And uh, given our uh, research interests, which spans from maternal and child health to environmental health, NCDs, it's a broad portfolio. But um, uh, we are not uh, guided in terms of uh, whether there is a call which would be relevant to us. We always see what it is in the country which is most important and needs to be addressed, then we go for that particular cause. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Kalpana. I'm a medical student here at USC. Um, so my question was kind of about the UN General Assembly meeting. Um, Ronnie mentioned to me that he went to that last week in New York uh, as part of the NCD Alliance. Um, and so I know the main themes kind of of this meeting were sustainable development and also universal health care. So I was kind of just wondering um, what was your role in the meeting this week and what was the role in the meeting in your lives? Okay, so um, at the UN General Assembly, there were three themes that, uh, that were discussed this year. Um, it was uh, tuberculosis, uh, pandemic preparedness, and um, UHC. And UHC has a political declaration which was written on in 2019, and NCD Alliance was ensuring that NCDs are written up in that political uh, declaration. For example, when the Millennium Development Goals were set up, NCDs were not mentioned at all. So this time around, uh, when SDGs were being discussed in 2015, NCD Alliance ensured that NCD was mentioned because that is where people have a lot of out-of-pocket expenditure, where the treatment is very expensive and leads people to poverty. So under universal health coverage, again, we wanted to ensure that NCDs are well represented and we were able to make statement um, to the member states that how important it was to increase financing for non-communicable diseases, because if we see the portion where 74% of global deaths are attributed to non-communicable diseases, but the percentage of global funds that we receive as NCDs to for any kind of work is the least as compared to HIV, tuberculosis, or any other um, disease condition. So that was our intent to be able to uh, request donors and with the stakeholders to prioritize in their country a prioritization, uh, non-communicable diseases, and definitely ensure under universal health coverage and cities are covered. Thank you. Shubha. Thank you so much, Dr. Aurora, for this presentation and for being with us today. Um, I was, like Heather, I was really struck in your presentation about how successfully you've been able to translate research into policy action. And what I learned from you about that, which is Clearly, you've been able to work with the Modi government to get them to act and turn things into raw policy, despite um, for the same type of special interest that must exist in India that exists here that prevents us from having some of the same success. Could you speak to us about that? Uh -huh. Uh, so yes, um, I think one reason is that government quickly did uh, take cognizance of this evidence. 
but also uh, we ensure that we are researching on contemporary issues uh, because we work with adolescents we exactly know what is um, erupting as which is going to be a next hit on adolescents particularly um, uh, working with them so we are quickly able to design study and be able to produce evidence which can be used by the government for policy making. So that is uh, one advantage, um, but also the current government surely is giving a lot of importance on ensuring that adolescents' health is protected and promoted. And the whole focus is not just on disease uh, treatment, but on wellness, um, which is not even uh, uh, shown in terms of um, the programming on uh, disease prevention, but yoga and uh, Ayurveda, alternate systems of medicine, all of it is being promoted from the wellness perspective. Thank you. We have a question in back. Um, uh, thank you so much for the very good talk. And I'm uh, very happy to be on And my aim is to go back to, to my country and do um, work in public health. So I'm very glad to be a part of this. Uh, one thing which struck in your presentation was, I think we discussed that the obesity in urban areas was increasing than the rural areas, but contrast to that in the forest plot, you that you showed the extreme states of Arunachal Pradesh, Lakshadweep and Jammu Kashmir, they had increasing uh, obesity. So I was wondering if would we know or if we are investigating that difference in your wild life? Because, as you know, in those states have urban areas, but in general, those are more rural than the other middle states. So, I was wondering if we have investigated or if that hypothesis might be investigated or why the extreme states are having high levels of investment. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very pleased to hear you want to come back and work in India. So we, we you already have employment available. <laughs> we are always very appreciative of people getting trained and coming back and working in India. Uh, we need all the strength, we need more expertise uh, to be able to address the humongous burden we have and it will only be growing as we are now the most populous country. So yes, uh, your observation is right. These trends have only been looked at from the prevalence perspective, but understanding the determinants, that is an area of research which has to uh, we have to work on. So addressing Michael's uh, uh, question also, what are the other areas of research we must explore and Heather's, uh, what determinants are actually influencing um, these, uh, but most of the burden that as of now has been seen is we see it in urban areas, and uh, among the rural poor, uh, which are already we are trying uh, seeing uh, hypertension, overweight, obesity in urban poor versus uh, those who are well off in the urban areas. But rural uh, and tribal is still where they do walk long distances. They get healthy uh, fruits and vegetables available for their consumption. Another question from back, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, my name is Fatima Tadnogo, and uh, I am um, currently a senior research associate in epidemiology in the department, and I did my PhD in epidemiology also in the department. Now, it, I first have a comment and then a question, and really it's just an acknowledgement of who you are and the great work that you're doing, which is really inspiring. It's inspiring for me to see your work in academic, but also the community and nonprofit organizations. You are first and you are a role model for me because I founded a nonprofit organization five years ago that's been supporting adolescent girls in Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. which is my native country. So seeing you present this, I really just all overjoyed because this is me in 20 years. <laughs> um, okay, so with that being said, uh, one of the things we focused on with Sahel State, which is the name of my 501c3 nonprofit is providing menstrual hygiene products and just financial support and a lot of mentorship for the girls. And our first cohort actually graduated middle school and is starting high school next week. Uh, nutrition is a great area of importance for me as an epidemiologist. 
And so my question now comes to you is, uh, I'm really curious in the area of nutrition literacy and health promotion mm -hmm. uh, for you in India. Are there any few lessons that you've learned about what strategies actually makes for effective intervention in terms of nutrition and literacy, and nutrition literacy and health promotion in other ones? So um, in our experience, the research that we have published, um, the strategies that have worked is, um, and this may be very Indian context, um, students being given extra grades for bringing healthy defense. Um, because it's very academic um, and very competitive environment, they would do anything to get that extra five marks. <laughs> so that worked very well when the students were just monitored by the class teacher and they were given scores on it. So that did work well. But um, uh, I'm fascinated by the NGO you have uh, formed. And in fact, we do every three to four years a global youth meet on health in India. And adolescents in the age group of 14 uh, to 19 and uh, 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 young adults up to 24 years of age are invited to come and present their best practices and learn from each other. So um, surely keep in touch and we would surely love to hear the work that is ongoing. Awesome, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, well, I think that will close the program. We've had an incredible set of presentations and discussions and points and I we all look forward to uh, some collaborations that will surely ensue. So let's thank our special guest.